I'm actually relatively new here at Brown. I started last uh, July. Um, and, uh, and so the work that I'm going to be talking about, much of it was done while I was at MIT, although some of it has continued um, uh, here at Brown. Uh, and it's, uh, even though these two universities are very, very different and they have very different mixtures of skills and uh, students, what's so interesting is that both share a passion for doing uh, rigorous uh, research that's relevant in the world. Uh, and, uh, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And all of what I talk about, I couldn't have done if I weren't working with really talented groups of, of students. So let me sort of contextualize uh, a little bit um, uh, the, the work that I'm going to talk about. Uh, today. And um, as I think everyone in this room uh, remembers, a little over a year ago, uh, in an industrial suburb of Dhaka, uh, Bangladesh, a building uh, housing various uh, garment factories uh, collapsed, killing over a thousand workers, mostly young women. And it's uh, the uh, worst industrial uh, accident uh, on record. And what was particularly striking about uh, the Rana Plaza factory uh, collapse was that it was completely avoidable. Uh, in fact, uh, cracks in the buildings, foundations, and in the walls uh, were reported the day before, right? They were reported to the police. The police came to the local building owner and said, you know, you should really shut this down. It's not safe. It was reported on the news, uh, and the workers uh, uh, were told about it. Um, but notwithstanding, so there was no lack of information. People knew what was going on. And notwithstanding that it was reported by the police, that it was reported in the news, that everyone knew about it, the next morning, as hundreds of workers were sort of milling around outside the factory, trying to decide whether they should go in or not, um, uh, several of the uh, factory owners, because the building had several factories in it, uh, their managers, and sometimes even their security guards, basically with bullhorns, sometimes with sticks, were sort of urging the workers to go back to work, uh, saying that don't worry about it, it's going to be uh, okay. And uh, what was striking is that these workers felt that they didn't have a choice, because they felt that if they didn't go back to work, they would lose their job. And so shortly after the shift began, uh, as they were in the early hours of their shift, uh, the building collapsed uh, and killed uh, uh, most of them. Now, what I think is particularly striking about the Rana Plaza incident is that it's by no means unique. It has been uh, preceded and, in fact, followed by many other tragic industrial uh, accidents, whether factory fires, other building collapses, uh, and things like that. And not just in Bangladesh, but in all of the countries that house the global supply chain factories. I mean, think about in 2012, the Foxconn factories that make these products, uh, where 24 workers uh, leapt uh, from the factory's uh, 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 roof uh, to their death. They committed suicide collectively because they felt that they had no choice that they were working too many hours, being paid uh, too, uh, uh, too little, uh, under very hazardous and stressful conditions, and they just couldn't take it uh, anymore. And what's interesting for me is that these newsworthy incidents are in fact dwarfed by the many more, much less spectacular, but still terrible abuses, like excess working hours, unsafe working conditions, poor pay and sexual harassment, either on the job or going back and forth to the job, that millions of workers who make the products that we buy every day have to endure. Right? Those don't show up in the newspaper, but those are the things that these workers experience every single day. And so what my work seeks to do, what, what this book that I published a year ago uh, tries to document, is what can we do to put an end to these abuses and promote more just working conditions for these millions of workers who make the products that we buy every single day, and how to do it in a way that reconciles market incentives. Because I believe that you can do that, right? We can't have some sort of fantasy life of like, this is what we're going to do, and let's forget about com competition and market. We have to reconcile those things. And what I want to try to show, and what I've been trying to show in my work, uh, is that one can actually reconcile market needs for competitiveness and a real concern for social and environmental sustainability by promoting four basic uh, things. And the four basic things that I think can promote just and sustainable working conditions in a market economy are first, 
building new capabilities within these supply chain factories so they can be bro both more efficient and more ethical workplaces. Now, what I'm going to talk about in a minute is that much of the discourse around global supply chains is usually a discourse of sort of evil managers in these exotic lands over there, and that they have to be kind of policed more often, more you know, frequently, more carefully, uh, stringently, et cetera. And what I'm going to uh, show is that actually most of these managers are actually very decent people trying to actually do the best they can under very tough conditions. No one ever taught them things that we teach in your basic core MBA course in terms of inventory management, operations management, aligning personnel planning with production planning, and things like that. And when you teach them these basic skills, and not only do they become more efficient in high quality workplaces, but they suddenly have the margins that they can vest in better working conditions, better wages, safer buildings, uh, et cetera. And I'm going to show you uh, evidence to show how that uh, works. The second thing that I think is important and that can be done, these are tangible things that can be done to improve the working conditions of these millions of factories, is to address some of what we call downstream business practices, right? Most of us focus, who work on these issues, focus on the factories or the farms that are making the goods that we, um, that we purchase. Uh, and that's a little bit sort of like looking for your car keys under the lamppost. You know, that's where the problem is, and so you go there. But that doesn't mean that that's where actually the source of some of these issues. In fact, the source of some of these issues are sometimes practices in headquarters in terms of their purchasing practices, their commercialization practices, uh, their product development design, market forecasting practices. Uh, and uh, through the research that I've done, which is now almost about 10 years of this research, I see that there's a lot of work that can be done in headquarters. So that what looks like small changes in their downstream practices could have enormous impacts upstream in the factory. And those are things that are very doable. The third thing that I think um, uh, we can do to improve the working conditions of these, uh, of these workers uh, is to um, promote uh, longer-term or trust-like relations between the buyers and suppliers. Right? The whole model of, so, you know, the global economy, people normally think of the global economy as like things like this used to be made here and now they're made over there. Well, that's not really how it works. Things like this basically are made out of many, many different components. Each of those components are made in very different kinds of places. Um, and uh, what happens is finally in southern China, they get sort of uh, assembled uh, uh, together. But because of the proliferation of production and its geographic distribution, traditional models of, um, of regulation right, uh, don't apply. And what's interesting is that this whole business model was based on certain assumptions, that we live in a world that has unlimited cheap labor, unlimited uh, cheap inputs, uh, in decreasing costs of transportation and logistics and communications, and, and no externalities, right? You don't have to pay for carbon or any of these things. That world's changing, right? <coughs> labor costs are going up, input costs are going up, transportation costs are going up, and in certain countries you're beginning to see real concerns around carbon tax and things like that. Companies know this, and as a result, they're reconfiguring their supply chain. So it's not like, let, let me make everything anywhere, and let's just sort of contract with the cheapest uh, suppliers, but let's actually somehow streamline our supply chain so that we can actually have longer term relations with a smaller number of suppliers that we can engage uh, with in collaborative manufacturing. That creates an incredible opportunity so that the buyers and suppliers don't have to actually play this cat and mouse game Right, where they're kind of the suppliers aren't really actually telling them the full overhead costs, and the buyers aren't really willing to commit to any you know short number of small number of suppliers, et cetera. But as that world changes, we can create an opportunity where there's real partnerships, and those partnerships will do a lot to improve the working conditions uh, in the supply chains. And finally, um, I think what's really important is if we really care about improving the working conditions of these workers, we have to bring the state in. There is a lot that private actors can do. And by private actors, I mean not just companies, but NGOs, multi-stakeholder initiatives, faith-based organizations. There's a lot that the private sector can do, but they can't do everything. There's a role for the state, and there are certain labor standards, like what we call enabling rights, the right for workers to organize collectively and bargain for better wages and things like that. Those are rights that cannot be enforced one factory at a time 
or one supply chain at, at, at a time. Those can only be enforced by the sovereign state that has the responsibility and the authority to do it. And by the way, these are citizenship rights. It's the state that should be enforcing the laws on the books, not the private sector. So those are the four uh, things that I want to talk about. Um, and um, and I, I want to show you that these are all within our reach. This isn't a pipe dream. These are things that are already happening in the real world. And if we can actually document them and show how well they work and help, help to diffuse them, I think that we can actually promote a globally efficient and also sustainable uh, economy. So let me tell you a little bit about um, how, I, how I got to make these wild claims that I'm making uh, uh, this, uh, this morning. And, uh, and tell you a little bit about the research, uh, because I think it's important. So um, normally when people work on these issues, they do either case studies or they actually don't have a lot of empirical evidence and they make a lot of strong claims. Uh, and uh, what we were able to do, and as I said, we, meaning me and different teams of graduate students, uh, first at MIT and now uh, here, we were able to convince leading global buyers to share with us um, their data, uh, their audit data. So all of these companies uh, basically um, go and inspect their factory, their supplier factories, uh, and they do it on an annual basis, sometimes more frequently, uh, et cetera, uh, depending on the risk um, that, they, uh, that they envision. Um, and so just to give you an example, Nike has uh, 900 suppliers located in 50 different countries, and they shared with me every single audit that was ever done on any of these factories from 2002 until 2011. All right, so that's just one example. But for example, another company that I studied, uh, Li and Fung, uh, was able uh, to share uh, with us 28,000 of their audits uh, for over uh, 10,000 uh, of their unique uh, suppliers. So what we're able to do is collect all of these audits. Now, those of you who might know a little bit about this world know that these data don't show up in a nice spreadsheet, right? That then you can just manipulate it and everything's good. These are documents that are multiple pages that have different uh, items on them and they're kind of like a checklist and they're weighted uh, differently. And so um, you had to sort of read through these things and code them and create a database. And I think what was very interesting is that none of these companies Apple, Nike, HP, Coca-Cola, et cetera, the companies that shared these data with us actually had ever actually organized these, these data. But this was a service that we did for them. And because I was fortunate enough to work at a university where there were lots of students with coding skills, we were able to actually come up with uh, something that helped us do that. So we had all these sourcing database, which basically gave us a proxy for like how good or bad are these working conditions, right? That's uh, uh, data. But we also had the sourcing database, and that was important. That was just descriptive statistics that said, where are these factories located? How big are they? How old are they? What kind of product do they make? Who owns them, et cetera? And what we did is a, a series of very simple sort of statistical analyses, trying to see if certain kind of usual suspects, like factories located in country A as opposed to B, or big factories as opposed to uh, small factories, or young factories as opposed to older factories, how, how did that sort of relate to working conditions? Um, and we came up with a series of sort of uh, interesting associations. But as all of you know, once you do those kind of statistical analyses, that just shows you that certain variables move together, right? It doesn't really tell you anything about causality. And so what we had to do is therefore do field research. Um, and so we went and visited all these factories in these leading uh, companies. I was able to randomly select which uh, factories we wanted to visit, and we did something called match pair analysis. And match pair analysis is you find factories located in the same country making more or less the same product for the same brands, roughly the same size, roughly the same age, right? So it's not perfect because we're talking about the real world, but you try to match it as carefully as possible. But you know from the sourcing data, right, the audit data, that some are treating their workers better than others. And so we want to understand why. So we went and actually did field research and spent all this time visiting these factories. In the end, we visited 150 factories in 10 of the leading uh, host countries of these supply chain uh, factories and conducted over 800 interviews. So this combination of quantitative data and qualitative data, we even went and like went on audits and sort of chaper, you know, sort of followed these auditors, auditors uh, to try to understand uh, what, was, uh, what was going on. What did we find? 
Uh, and I'm going to make uh, sort of tell you a little bit about the key findings, and then I'm going to present some data to support these uh, key findings, and then I'll open it up for question uh, and answer. I'm, I'm not going to spend all the time just talking at you. So uh, the first finding, um, which is kind of a, a, a downer uh, finding, is that the traditional approach that companies and labor rights NGOs actually promote and use to try to address these issues, which is a private compliance approach, it's actually not that effective. Right? The traditional approach is that companies you know, develop a code of conduct, they ask their suppliers to sign that code of conduct, then they audit the suppliers to see if they're in compliance with the code of conduct. Uh, if they are in compliance, everything's good, keep on buying from them. If they're not in compliance and there's a remediation plan, they get inspected again. And then if they don't improve, the idea is that you pull the orders or you decrease the orders or you somehow penalize them for not, uh, for not behaving. That is the dominant way that private companies seek to address these issues, and even the NGOs tell them to do it. If you remember, every single time that there's a newspaper article about um, Rana Plaza or any of these things, if you read the articles, it always says they need to be inspected more often, more rigorously, more transparently, transparently uh, et cetera. And what I learned through doing this work, and it wasn't something that I, I actually thought that compliance worked or could work, and what I realized is simply going and inspecting a factory once a year and collecting information and thinking that that information was going to drive behaviors when all the incentives weren't, weren't quite aligned, that's not going to really make a difference. I'm not saying it doesn't make any difference. What you see is actually a lot of factories do improve, but then they stall. They never keep on improving. They stall. Some of them actually, in fact, most of them go in and out of compliance, which I think is a really interesting thing. So that's finding number one. And I think that's important. Because if it's not working, then we shouldn't be throwing all this time and money and attention at it. And, and, and companies do. I mean, a company like Nike has 100 full-time workers just doing factory audits. Plus, they actually contract with external companies and NGOs, et cetera. They spend millions and millions of dollars doing this. And uh, maybe that time and those personnel and those funds can actually be allocated to something that's more effective. That's the second point. And the second point that I think uh, really matters is um, capability building. So as I said to you, um, the discourse is that there's some, you know, there are like evil people that have to be inspected more often. And while, you know, some of the, I, I think that the owner of Rana Plaza building was probably not the most morally, you know, uh, upright kind of person, um, but most of these people are actually um, really decent people who are working really hard to make things um, um, work under very, very hard conditions. If you actually go and look at who's running these factories, they were often really good workers on the line, some of whom got promoted to be line supervisors. And of those line supervisors, some of them got promoted to be factory managers in Taiwan, but suddenly they're running a factory in southern China, Vietnam, or even Guatemala. And as I said, no one ever taught them human resource management and how to treat people in a particular way. No one ever taught them that you should actually align your work hours and your personnel planning with your production orders rather than have people just sitting around when you don't have an order and then the orders come in and you make them work overtime because you haven't figured out how to do this. And if you teach them these very basic skills, especially inventory management, they have all this stuff in inventory, millions of dollars which they don't even know that they have or how to access it when they need it, et cetera, and that really uh, puts a real burden on them. And if you teach them these basic things, um, it's amazing the kind of improvements uh, that can happen. I'll show you real evidence for how, how this works. Uh, the third point that's not raised uh, here uh, in the slide is uh, that point I said about uh, downstream business practices. How do we actually get the brands and the global buyers to actually get their act together in terms of market forecasting, product development, design, commercialization? What we you know, I taught in a business school for many years what we used to call lean enterprise, not just lean manufacturing. Once you get them to do that, you can imagine all sorts of savings that can be done in the downstream area, and that has an incredible consequence upstream. Just to give you an example of why this matters, um, when I was doing this field research um, initially, and I would go and visit these different factories, as I said, we'd do these interviews with these factory managers, and they would say, well, you know, Nike speaks with two sides of their mouth. On the one hand, uh, they want us to respect the code of conduct and no child labor and overtime, and on the other hand, on the other hand, they want the same product that we made last year, cheaper, faster, and maybe with a more variation, you know, uh, et cetera. And at first, yeah, I thought, okay, that's just sort of sour grapes, you know, that person's just making it up. But when I kept on hearing this, 
um, I went back and looked at the sourcing database. And the sourcing database actually showed me that these Nike purchasing managers were placing orders above the known capacity of the plant. So if the plant could only make 20,000 pair of running shoes a month, why was there an order for 25,000 uh, there? And of course, the rational plant manager isn't going to say no to a big order. They're going to take that order, right? It, the same thing is the order was supposed to be placed 11 weeks or 11 and a half weeks uh, <coughs> before uh, delivery date, right? You have a certain amount of time that you need to place the order because they have to buy the inputs, they have to organize their production, et cetera. But you started seeing that the order actually was placed at 10 weeks or nine and a half weeks. And then the order was changed. If the original order was 20,000 pair of black running shorts, now you see that the order got changed at week, say, 9 or 8, and it became 15,000 black and, and 10,000 red or something like that, right? They, they started sort of changing uh, the order. And so again, what happens is what looks like very small changes, right? in the downstream actually have a bullwhip effect when it goes um, upstream because the rational plant manager is not going to suddenly run out and hire a lot of new workers because they don't know if they're going to have a big order next season or next year. They're not going to go out and buy new plant and, uh, and build, uh, build new plant and buy new equipment, et cetera. So they make do with what they have, which is excess overtime, right? And what they know is if they never ship the order on time, they'll never get an order. Right? Again, that delivery date is absolutely key uh, for these consumer uh, goods. And so what they end up doing is they eat the, the, these delays by end up uh, sending a lot of this product air freight as opposed to regular freight, and they pay the difference. And so their margins get compressed, and therefore they can't pay better wages or working conditions and, and things like that. It's not because they're evil people or because they're even incapable. It's because their, their buyers are making uh, um, some mistakes which they could avoid. Um, and I'll talk about that as well. As well. And finally, as I said, um, we need to bring in the state, but not traditional, you know, sort of top-down command and control regulation. That that hasn't really worked just about anywhere. Um, uh, but much more kind of responsive uh, regulation. And there's really interesting real-world experiments out there uh, in labor uh, in improvements in Latin America and a variety of other countries where the public and private sector are working together to promote what they call sustainable compliance, making sure that the firms actually competitive in mo world markets, but actually slowly but surely building up their own capabilities so that they can actually respect the laws on the books. So now that I've made lots of claims, let me give you some evidence. Um, so this is uh, from the very first study that we did, which was at Nike. And all this really shows you is the results of one of their audits. And so this was the M audit, management audit, which looks at working hours, wages, age, um, working conditions, and things like that. And if you remember, um, that uh, I told you that the Nike had about 900 suppliers. By the time they, they shared these data uh, with us, uh, they had only done audits uh, for 575 of them. And we needed this because this was the first time that they were using this very rigorous audit of their supply base. And I wanted to have sort of a baseline uh, data. I wanted to know, like, well, before we think our thing's getting better, let's just see what it looks like now. And this was really important because it, what it shows is if it's one that means uh, close to 100% in compliance to the code of conduct. If it's on this side, it shows pretty far away from being um, uh, in compliance with the code of conduct. And what you'll see, it's more or less a normal distribution, right? That some are in really great shape, some are far from it, most are in between, uh, et cetera. And if you slice and dice the data by looking at not just all of their suppliers, but if you look at footwear as opposed to equipment, as opposed to apparel, those are the three lines of business, you see also a normal distribution. If we divide it by region, we will also see a normal distribution, although maybe in certain uh, regions, like for example around Asia, the curve might be more in this area, and in the Americas, the curve in that area. But that's, that's important facts, because it was the first time that anyone had ever shown through data that they're not all sweatshops. Some of them are good working places, and some of them aren't good working places, but that's important for us uh, to know. And I did this for all of the studies, for Coca-Cola, for sugar supply chain, uh, for Apple and HP in terms of consumer electronics, uh, for Philips Van Heusen, for uh, apparel, uh, et cetera. So we'd always collect the data and try to get a baseline uh, uh, assessment. But then what we wanted to know is, are things getting better over time? 
And what was interesting is that these were publicly available data uh, that Nike released. And you know, as I remember, I told you that these audits are multiple pages, and they have lots of different items, and they're weighted differently. And no purchasing manager has the time to read these audits. Right? What they want is just very clear information, like go or no go. So all of these companies develop a grading system, just like school. Like A is great, and B is like some room for improvement, but you know it's it's possible. C is you know a lot of room for improvement, but you have a good attitude. And D is like forget it. You know we shouldn't be doing business uh, with those uh, with those companies. And they have color code too, just like traffic. And what you can see is um, two things. One is uh, half of uh, Nike's uh, supply base is scoring B, and I think that's driving the high average. But the other thing that we would see is that um, we'd want to see a growth of A's and B's and a decline of C's and D's, and we don't see that, right? We see, in fact, the opposite. Now, because they, ga they gave us these data in this form, I did not know that the same factories were actually being graded every year, and so maybe there was a selection bias. But for 763 of the factories, I actually got the history of all the grades. And all I did is just compare the first grade from the last grade. And what you can see is over 40% see no change at all, and an additional 30% see uh, deterioration of their grading, either by a little or a lot. And so, this is, so I can actually track by establishment what's going on. When I presented these data to the Nike compliance team, needless to say, they were not very happy with me um, because this does show that um, all of their time, all of this money, et cetera, is not maybe giving the bang for the buck. And if you look over time, you can sort of think, see that things get stagnant, right? So they basically are at like a B minus level um, over time, even into 2012. And if you look regionally, you can see that there's more C's and D's in the regions that are actually where more of the production is being moved, as opposed to the uh, EMEA's Europe, uh, where, um, uh, where things are going. Yeah? Why would these companies share this data with you? Um, because uh, the argument that I made uh, was, uh, don't you want to know uh, if it's working or not? Uh, everyone already knew that they had problems. Um, and the argument that I've made is um, we were going to do an objective analytical analysis of what worked and what didn't, and we were going to give it back to them. They didn't pay, this was all funded through independent um, foundations, uh, and the deal was we will give you this analysis for free. You give us data and access. And Nike took a risk. Um, and once they did, then the other companies uh, started joining on. And you told them you would share this with the public? Uh, in the uh, non-disclosure agreement that uh, MIT lawyers uh, negotiated with the Nike uh, lawyers and everyone else, uh, at MIT you cannot do research that doesn't co go into the public eye. Um, and that was really good for me. Uh, Brown, by the way, it's the same thing. Uh, and, um, and so basically they could say, we don't want you to use our name, so you could say a large global athletic apparel company that seem, you know, and then people, you know, or the large carbonated beverage company, uh, you know. So I mean, you, you could you could disguise it if you wanted, but actually, as you'll see in a minute, um, it's not just a negative story, and there's a real positive story, and they wanted to see that. And actually, to Nike's credit, they uh, have actually shifted their behaviors and some of their practices based on our research, and that was, re and the, and they actually have hot links to our papers. Uh, on their on their website, um, so that was Nike. The first time we did the Nike work, you know, people said, "Oh, everyone knows that Nike is a bad company," which is not true. It's actually an excellent company, uh, and everyone knows that footwear is you know low tech, you know, which is of course not true. Actually, footwear is actually very high tech, um, and so um, you know you're just telling one story, and so that's why we had to replicate it. And like, okay, let's go repeat it in different industries with different companies with different kinds of market pressures and reputations. And here's HP. And HP, if anything, is you know high tech, consumer electronics, great corporate citizen. You know the HP way. You know really treating the community and the environment uh, well. And of the so they shared um, audit data for 262 of their suppliers, which basically is only about 20% uh, of their entire supply base, but it's basically 80% of their spend. So these are the most important uh, suppliers. Only seven of those were in full compliance. And if you actually look at the others. What you'll see, and, and you can sort of see, right, as I said, not all the audits are fully uh, filled out um, by item, but you can see that there's actually variation not by entire establishment or not, but even within establishments by issue. 
And so some, for example, on some issues like free, freely chosen employment, so that's a nice word for no slave or indentured uh, labor, uh, most of them, not all, but most of them are in, in compliance. But the real issues are work hours, uh, hazardous materials, which is a big thing in electronics, uh, et cetera, and they're not in compliance. Uh, so even you know, good corporate citizen, HP, has its issues. And Li and Fung, which is a company that many people have never heard of, but it's an, an enormous and very, very important uh, company. It's actually one of Walmart's largest uh, suppliers out of China. As I said, they share with us 28,000 audits for about 10,000 individual factories that had actually gone through 10 cycles of audits. And you can see their rating system is a little different. This is how they call it. But basically, it's kind of stagnant between immediate action uh, and uh, continuous uh, improvement. Each of those little blue dots is, uh, is a data point. So what I've told you so far is that um, the traditional model doesn't work all that well, right? And, and people who follow this might not think that that's surprising, but I think it's important uh, empirically to show this because what's most important is to show what does work. And so what does work is this capability building story that I told uh, earlier. And what's interesting about the capability building story was um, we completely stumbled into this by doing field research. We would never have seen it if we hadn't been visiting all these factories. So here's a tale of two factories in Mexico. They um, are so in the same country, paying the same local, the legal minimum wage. Uh, Mexico has different wage uh, uh, categories, different structures in different regions, but they're in the same region, so they're paying the same, uh, the same uh, minimum wage. They're organized by the same union. Uh, they're both making the same product, which are these kind of high-tech running T-shirts that flick off your sweat when you exercise. Um, they're of the same size, of the same age, but as you can see, plant A, has higher wages, that's because of productivity. It has a modern uh, work uh, organization, which is more like lean manufacturing, uh, it goes to apparel. Those of you, if you've ever been in an apparel factory, it's usually a, a traditional model is a very long line of sewing operators, and uh, a piece of garment is broken down into its constituent pieces. It's called a bundle, it gets tied up, and so uh, one person at station will sew this and then tie it back up and give it to the person behind her. It's almost always women, and then she'll, the other person sews this one, and they keep on going down the line until the product is finished. In this more modern system, what you have is production not by line, but it's organized more like a U, and you'll have a worker doing several different uh, functions and also in, in charge of quality control, as opposed to doing the quality control at the end uh, of the line. So very different organization of work. Truth of advertising, this is owned by locals as well as employees locals. This is owned by a foreign company as opposed to um, uh, a local company, but because I had so many observations, whether or not workers are treated well has nothing to do with your nationality or headquarters or things like that. It, it's, it's other things. So I just want to tell you the truth, that, that they're not exactly matched, but that one doesn't matter. And this is important. Um, there's overtime everywhere, and workers want overtime because they get paid more. Right? They get paid time and a half, sometimes double t time uh, if they want to. And the issue is whether you stay within the legal limits of overtime, you know, 60 hours uh, uh, max a, a week, because lots of studies have shown that if you don't take pauses and work too many hours, you start, your body starts breaking down, you become prone to accidents, uh, and whether or not it's voluntary. Like, you know, my daughter's getting married, I need to earn a little extra money for a dowry, so I sign up for extra work hours as opposed to no one's leaving the room until the order is done. Uh, and if you try to leave, leave the room, uh, you know, get, don't come back tomorrow because you won't have a job. And there are real differences uh, across those diff diff different factories. Notwithstanding that Plant A pays better, has a more modern work system, and respects the law in terms of overtime, what's interesting is these two uh, uh, lines right here, uh, which are that uh, productivity is higher in A than B, and unit costs are lower in A as opposed to B. In other words, sometimes good things can go hand in hand. You can treat people better, have a more skilled work experience, pay them better, and uh, actually have uh, lower costs and greater efficiencies. Yeah, it's the same. We have quality data uh, as well. And uh, what's interesting is plant A used to be just like plant B. It used to have the same production system because we had historic data, the same production system, the same problems, the same wages, the same productivity, uh, et cetera. And the story was amazing. You know, when we interviewed these people and we said, you know, why are you doing this? 
Um, and they said, well, you know, we were reading this trade magazine, and this trade magazine was talking about lean manufacturing in the auto industry, uh, and about how, you know, it's great, better efficiency and quality and uh, variable batch sizes, and that seemed really interesting to us. And we asked the Nike uh, regional officers, we said, you know, do you know anything about lean? And they said, actually, we know a lot about lean. Uh, we have a lean training center for our footwear uh, suppliers in Vietnam. Uh, why? And they said, well, we'd actually learn, like to learn how to do this. And so Nike managers, by the way, the same people who go and do the audits, worked with them and basically got in audit, you know, technicians and consultants, et cetera, to reorganize the shop floor, to retrain the workers, uh, et cetera, so they can go from the old system to the new uh, system. What's interesting is it didn't go one day to the next, right? When you make a radical change like that, things usually get worse before they get better, and they knew it. So Nike basically said, and this is the quality issue, they said, we know things are going to get worse before they get better when you make this shift. Um, we will stick by you, even though we know your efficiency originally is going to go down and your quality is going to go down, as long as we see you're committed. So they kept guaranteeing them future orders as long as they saw this commitment. And likewise, Plant A managers told Plant B managers, we know that things are going to get worse for better. That productivity bonus that's really important to you, that's going to go down because you were really good at doing this. But now that you have to do this, you don't, you, your productivity is going to go down. As long as we see that you're committed, we will promise you 81% of your previous productivity bonus during this transition. And over several months, they were able to learn new skills, reorganize the shop floor, and develop this new system. I saw this not just in Mexico in factories making t-shirts. I saw it in southern Brazil when I looked at sugar mills uh, uh, supplying Coca-Cola. I saw it in uh, consumer electronics plants uh, in, in, uh, in southern uh, uh, China. I saw it in garment uh, plants in Central America and parts of India. I would, once I saw this, I thought, wow, look, you see it everywhere. Uh, and this is really interesting. By the way, it doesn't cost more than traditional compliance. It's basically investment in people, some training, some uh, reorgani reorganization of often the same kinds of uh, uh, equipment that you have, some new investment, but not, not a ton. Uh, and it's really interesting. So of course, you know, academics are all, you know, the way that we differentiate ourselves is we try to use fancy words to talk about the work we do, and we try to be like smart alecks in rooms uh, when people are presenting work. And so um, when I first presented this work, I remember the academics would say, like, oh, yeah, well, if it's so good, you know, you know people aren't going to leave money on the table. You know, people would naturally embrace it. Uh, and, uh, you know, how come it's not generalizable? Uh, very nice folkloric, you know, story, Professor Locke, but I don't really believe that it's, uh, it's uh, something that we can uh, hedge our bets uh, on. So um, we convinced Nike to let us study the rollout of lean on all their apparel uh, suppliers. Uh, and so uh, Nike has, remember, 900 suppliers, most of them are apparel, so almost 600 of them are located in those countries, and you can see uh, some of those countries are not known for being great places. Uh, and, um, and of their total uh, sub factories making apparel, 85 of them actually decided to embrace lean, uh, the LDG, the Lean uh, Development Group. And so we were able to study both those who embraced as opposed to that didn't, and also those that embraced over time uh, what, what happened. And initially, if you look at the differences between those that did and those that uh, didn't, do you have a question? <coughs> yeah, it's too short. But, um, how would like, someone like Nike initiate a change like this? I'll tell you in a minute. I'll tell you in a minute. And so what, um, what these, uh, what these uh, factories, uh, if you look at the comparison between those who uh, embraced uh, lean and those that didn't, you know, in the end, that's, those aren't big differences. Uh, so a three uh, would be a B, a two is a C, just the numerical, okay, um, et cetera. There aren't big uh, differences. But that's because it takes a really long time to actually introduce lean, to get your question. So factories actually have to sign up for lean. They send their factory managers to a training center in Sri Lanka, and they actually, the training uh, takes uh, something like 10 weeks, uh, of which um, uh, the first six to eight weeks are on site in Sri Lanka, which is actually a production uh, place, so they're learning how to do things. Then they have to go back to their home uh, factories and introduce these changes, and then the, factory, the Nike people come and certify the lines. And it, it takes a long time, and that's why it takes a while for these lines uh, to be certified over time. But 
what we did is uh, we were able to track both changes over time and comparison of those factories that did, that those factories that didn't. My biggest, so th the big thing in social science these days are randomized control trials, right? You try to do like clinical work in social science and I tried to convince Nike like, oh, let us randomize, you know, which ones you're gonna do it. And like, are you kidding? We're running a business, you know? Don't, <laughs> you know, like, we're not gonna do that. Uh, and so the best, uh, the second best thing that we could do is basically, uh, basically, control uh, as carefully as we could uh, selection biases of the factories, right? Those that signed up maybe already had something going for them as opposed to the, those that didn't. And what this shows you is up to two years before, so if it crosses this line, it means statistically it has no validity, right? That's, what, that's all that's showing. And up to two years before they did every, any intervention, there's no difference between those factories that embrace lean and those that don't. But if you track it over time, by, the, by basically the year and a half, two years in, you start seeing significant differences, so significant that it actually is a full grade. It's a B to an A or a C to a B. Nike did not embrace lean because it wanted to improve working conditions. It embraced lean and it promoted this among its suppliers because it was good for business, for better efficiency, quality, throughput, for you know, variability of a batch size. But because they were more efficient production and because they had to empower the workers to get this thing done, et cetera, I mean, a worker who can stop the line because of quality is also a worker that feels empowered about how they're going to be treated. It had tremendous spillover effects. Um, for uh, the working conditions. And I think this is very, very promising because it, al it aligns the incentives. It's good for the workers, it's good for the supplier, and it's good for the buyers who are buying from those uh, suppliers. And as I said, it doesn't cost more than traditional uh, compliance. Um, I'm going to uh, just say one last point and then throw it open for questions, which is, um, as I said, there's a lot that the private sector can do um, and, and in ways that align the incentives. Um, and I think that's really important, and it's really important for people like me and, and, and all of us uh, to show that, because unless you get the private sector involved, it's not going to happen. And again, and, and, and by private, I mean not just companies, but also NGOs. We have to get them aligned for what really works as opposed to what they can, can campaign about. Uh, and I think this is really important. But there's no substitute for having the government do its job. And one of the things that we were able to see, and this is a complicated uh, slide, but all it really shows is that um, in countries that have stronger rule of law and institutions that work, that's where your compliance is actually better. Because government is basically enforcing the laws on its books, and the private sector can actually take care of business on its own, and actually working together, it's really interesting. So I've seen lots of cases, for example, where uh, the private sector uh, uh, company auditors make sure that the books are in order, that they're actually tracking well, and now that they, they have good record keeping, et cetera, the state can go in and check to make sure that things are actually in place, or because the private sector is actually doing a good job monitoring a certain segment of the population, and the government has very uh, limited resources, they can actually focus not on the export-oriented production, but on the domestic-oriented production, which is actually much worse often in terms of working conditions and, and wages uh, and things like that. And I've also seen, especially in parts of Brazil, really interesting work where these labor inspectors are working with local banks uh, and suppliers and the local government to basically not target one factory at a time, but basically, look, this is a common problem. How do we sort of raise everyone together so that you're actually investing in common environmental protection uh, equipment or you're improving the workers? And so there's some really interesting public-private experiments that bring together um, um, uh, what, I th what I think promote uh, sustainable compliance. So let me just uh, stop there and open it up uh, for questions, discussion, uh, uh, whatever, you, whatever you want. Yes. And if you could just tell me who you are um, briefly, that, or tell us who you are, that would be great. Uh, I'm Peter Lichtenbaum. Uh, uh, I'm a lawyer in private practice in Washington, international issues. My daughter's graduating. Um, Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Um, I actually do compliance for a living, but in a different area. Um, I was curious to your view on um, uh, consumers in the of these products in the you know developed world. 
um, and your view on fair trade type campaigns, whether those are important in, in affecting companies' incentives uh, or not. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, um, I, th I think that um, these movements for fair trade, ethical sourcing, uh, things like that, I think they're important. But what we know is that they're actually extremely limited, right? A very small percentage of, uh, of individual markets. I think it's 5% of the coffee market or something like that are actually being uh, impacted um, by that. But, uh, but I think that it, it's, it's a good start. But I worry about it, um, and, I, and I worry about it because I worry that um, we as individual consumers will go to Starbucks and we'll pay you know, a quarter more for our shade-grown, organic, fair trade certified coffee, uh, and then we'll feel, okay, I've done my part, you know, let's go on. And if somehow we can get people to say, you know, that's happening, but how do we translate that into thinking about consumption um, and, uh, and what we might be demanding? So, we can't take ourselves off the hook. We want a new one of these every nine months. And we want it really fast, and we want it with more bells and whistles, and we don't really want to pay more for it, right? The average life cycle of a consumer electronic is nine, not this one, not Apple, but the others are nine months, right? Um, and because of that average life cycle, no retailer wants to hold on to a lot of inventory, right? There's four retail channels in the United States that control 75% of the consumer electronic uh, market, Best Buy, Amazon, et cetera. So uh, because uh, of the short product life cycles and because um, they have to discount them pretty quickly, they don't hold on to inventory. Hence, the brands don't hold on to inventory. And hence, what they do is they have modular uh, uh, production. You know, all of these are made up in modules. So some of these modules can go into here. Some of them can go into an iPad, some into an airbook. And all of those modules are stored relatively close to final assembly. And so what ends up happening is consumers, uh, it used to be that there, it went like this, like, you know, before Christmas and then, you know, things like that. Now it's like this. There's a lot of volatility, and this is not just for these. Uh, if you look at apparel, a company like uh, uh, Gap uh, only sells 30% of its uh, product at, at full price. Most of it gets discounted, so they, they too don't want to have a lot of inventory, et cetera. And so a lot of this kind of quick response, fast fashion, things like that, um, that drives a lot of the pressure onto the factories in terms of work hours, um, hiring and firing of migrant labor, uh, et cetera. And so what I think would be interesting is, and, and again, it's really true, I don't have the answer for this because we're not, you know, we're not in a robust economy, so you don't want to tell people, like, stop buying things. Uh, that wouldn't be a good thing. Um, but I think it would be good for us to have a conversation about um, do we really need a, uh, one of these every nine months, or um, do we really need it the same day that it gets released in every 100 markets, right? That, uh, or would, would I be willing to wait another two weeks for it so I can sort of smooth out the delivery and maybe not put all this pressure uh, on workers? Or do I need really have 20 of these hanging in my uh, closet? Or could I live just as well with 10, uh, maybe of higher quality, maybe pay, pay a little bit more, uh, and, uh, and maybe some of that uh, would um, relax the kinds of constraints on the factories. Uh, different countries actually have really different consumption patterns. Uh, some of the European countries have different consumption patterns than, than I do, and let alone my kids. Um, but, um, but I think I would like to see the conversation about ethical consumption move away from just, I did my part, I spent 25 cents more, to how much do we have to buy, what's that about, how do we link consumption patterns with environmental issues. As well as uh, as well as with uh, labor justice issues, but again, how to do it in ways that respect the market and the need for growth and profitability and stuff like that. I think we can have that conversation, but we we're not anywhere close to it uh, in the way that the the fair trade movement has been uh, framed right now. Yes, I'm Matt Schmitz. I'm graduating in uh, not right now. I'll be walking, but I'm graduating in December. Um, I'm curious, it seems like a lot of the benefits from the lean manufacturing and come from sort of improving efficiency and that, that of course improves workers' wages and then factory managers don't have to force them to work overtime, etc. Um, but it seems like if you were to implement lean manufacturing in all uh, factories, yeah. then the expectations uh, of 
companies like Nike would be that they can rather than change an order from a thousand black shoes to something a week before they'll be changing it you know a day before yeah. uh, or in other words it seems like the only reason that these factories are uh, doing better is because their their workers are conditions are improving is because they're above sort of what the standard expectations are about their production yeah. and so it seems like perhaps I'm curious how you see this as a long-term uh, improvement once yeah. more factories pick this up. That's great. That's a great question. Um, and there are actually two questions uh, there. Um, so the first one is, I, I think, important. Um, just introducing process improvements, lean is one, but there's a bunch of others, um, uh, gives you the, um, it's necessary but not sufficient to improve working conditions. Because what you do with those gains uh, is a big uh, is a big issue. So in the case of Nike, they seem to be distributing those gains. I studied a similar kind of pro program uh, that was done for electronic suppliers in um, the Pearl River de Delta, and you didn't see any improvements uh, for the labor. What ended up happening is the buyer saw those lower costs and actually wanted lower uh, prices for those goods the next year and uh, suppliers and resisted doing those so it's not just a technocratic thing it's also a distributive issue and that's actually micropolitics you know how do you share the the, the benefits etc the second question is you know in the world of worlds in my dream world everyone's doing some version of lean and then we have these great workplaces and stuff like but then then there's no competitive um, advantage and then maybe we're going to go back to some sort of race to the bottom etc and i have two responses to that number one is we are so far away from there so let's do as much as we can so that we can actually sort of start picking these low-hanging fruit um, and two once we get there then it actually gives us a moment to say we've come to our, you know, here we are at the limit where, you know, uh, we've got as much efficiency gains and productivity, you know, and quality gains, et cetera, that we could get, and there's going to be a trade-off. You know, do we keep on doing this, uh, or do we have to raise costs or lower wages, et cetera? But at least we would know what that trade-off is. We'd have that information, and then we could make informed decisions about, you know, we're going to pay a little less, or we're going to pay a little more, or something. Again, we're not anywhere near that point. And so I would like us to get there and then have informed discussions about we're willing to pay a little bit more of this or less of that or something like that. Um, so I, I, my view is, you know, let's go out and do as much process improvement as we can. It's not going to solve all the problems, but it will solve some of them. And then once we get to that uh, hard s spot where we have to make some choices, then let's have informed decisions about what those choices entail. Yes. Uh, my name is Russell Schmitz. I'm Matt's brother. I work as a... Uh, a consultant at an environmental engineering firm, and I see a lot of parallels between, um, you know, the environmental focus that is emerging today. Yeah. Uh, you did mention carbon tax yeah. and so on and so forth, and the sort of worker well-being focus in that you have an industry where a lot of times the well-being or the environmental impact is um, disregarded for economic reasons. And yeah. one of the models that I've seen. At very, for various state and uh, federal level regulation of environmental um, uh, issues is that it's the, the government here does, in a lot of cases doesn't have the resources to police everybody but That's they right. say we're going to impose uh, uh, fines or whatever punishments that are so severe that every company is going to be really interested in really well regulating himself. Um, is there some sort of parallel that could be applied in uh, for, for worker well-being? Um, yeah, that, it's exactly. Traditionally, it's been the same model in environment, um, health and safety, uh, and in labor. And it's called the deterrence model, uh, which is you know if the probability of getting caught out of compliance is sufficiently high, uh, if the probability of being fined once you're caught is sufficiently high, and if the fine is significantly stiff then it's going to shift the incentives of what they call amoral calculators, otherwise known as managers, uh, to, um, <laughs> to, um, to actually do the right thing. That's how a lot of uh, both public regulation uh, has been designed uh, as well as private uh, regulation. Uh, and quite honestly, there's been a ton of work that shows that it's not all that effective because it engages in this cat and mouse game and that uh, in environment, uh, the there's um, 
really, really good work. Um, uh, the book's called Shades of Green, about environmental protection. And then there's another one, Voluntary uh, Environmentalist, uh, a guy named Asim Prakash. So Shades of Green is um, by guys at Stanford, and uh, Voluntary Environmentalist is a person at University of Washington. Uh, and they actually show that what's much more effective is when you educate the managers and um, on you know their processes, get them engaged in the regulatory process, et cetera. Uh, and when you do that, uh, it's actually much more effective than the, the the traditional deterrence approach. My capability building story, which is actually a commitment story, is is completely parallel, uh, which is like forget about this deterrence thing. We stop at stoplights, not because we think the cop is hiding around the corner is going to find us. We stop because we know it's in our best interest, uh, because if we don't and no one else does, bad things can happen, right? Uh, and um, and uh, using that insight, you can design lots of different, I think, much more participatory and less onerous regulatory um, uh, 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 systems, uh, because the deterrence model treats people who really want to do the right thing uh, as in the same way that the people who are trying not to do when you lean on that, that shuts off the light. So if you just touch the top build, yeah, it's one of the things I've learned over the course of this year. Um, so anyway, so anyways, it, uh, we have the same model. Uh, it has the same kinds of problems, and you can do. There's a lot of really, really interesting work in the United States that shows innovative approaches to environmental regulation. Yes. I'm a brother of a Brown graduate right now. Great. This is actually a very interesting to me because in the next six months I might be in a position to be to join the ranks of these amoral calculators uh, for a factory in India producing consumer durables. So, Good. given this very short time frame, um, I'm curious what are these specific capability building resources? You mentioned lean in particular, and you said there's some others. If I have very limited time and I want to get the most bang for my buck of time and energy that I can invest in learning this right now, how would you suggest I prioritize my um, Go take the equivalent of uh, the core MBA uh, program. So learn about operations management, learn about accounting, learn about human resource management, uh, et cetera. Um, and they have these programs, actually intense programs in the summer. You know, Dartmouth has one and uh, a few other places. Uh, I don't know if you've already done that. If you've already done that, then. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I, I think um, learning how these different pieces fit together um, and, and learning how, in fact, um, uh, if you align these systems in a certain way um, and treat people as people who, like, want to do the right thing and if they have the right skills, they will do the right thing, it, it, it's, it's true in any walk of life, right? Um, I think that you always get more out of the system uh, than if you're trying to clamp down and police them. Um, and so that would be my uh, two-second word of worldly advice. But it's good that you're going to become a manager. Uh, that's what we need. Yes? Hi, I'm Brad Clifton. My daughter's graduating tomorrow. I worked in um, manufacturing R&D for 20 years. And I'm now in IT for a large global company. My question is, in your analysis, did you, uh, you pointed to um, potential solutions in the areas of manufacturing, inventory management, lean manufacturing, the latest. Uh, what about product design? Did any of your uh, analysis lead you to uh, changes in the product design or pro practices there that would then impact downstream yeah. inventory management, manufacturing, et cetera? Yeah, that's a, that's a terrific uh, question. Uh, so once we discovered those, as I said, those delays and those things that were going on, um, we went back to Nike um, and, um, and talked to them about it and said, yeah, you're right, we have all these delays. And we did this whole exercise where we took brown butcher uh, uh, paper, um, put it on a wall and said, you know, when were the gates for when you should have the dyes, the dyeing samples right and stuff? And when did you actually do it for a, a bunch of products? And you could see small little delays, right? It, it didn't look intentional. It looked like just sort of small uh, uh, little delays. and. Um, but as I said, had a big bullwhip effect uh, uh, down upstream uh, for the factories. And so we said, and I said, well, you know, what's going on? They said, oh, it's these designers, you know, they're, you know, they're so creative, they think out of the box, you can't do anything about them, uh, et cetera. And, and, um, and I said, really? Um, and, and, and so we went and interviewed these, you know, creative out of the box designers. And of course, they're just like fighting fire because, fires, because what they have to do is 
Um, there's been a proliferation of different product types in almost all consumer goods. And so when they used to have to make like 20 different products and they could maybe think more creatively, now what they're doing is because they have to make 50, they're taking last year's or last season's product and it was all black shorts and now they put like a red thread on the side and like, all right, new product and they keep on doing it. So their work has really changed. Um, on the environmental side, I actually did some work about how do you give designers tools. And so Nike actually did a very interesting thing called the Considered Index, where it gave designers a set of tools so that if they were designing new products, they could figure out um, you know, if they use recycled material as opposed to virgin material, uh, water-based solvents as opposed to chemical-based solvents, and it would actually get a different scoring, and it was like lead certification, it gave different things. And it, so it made it easy for people to do the job that they already had to do, and it drove at the, at the upfront, you know, how to make a product in a more sustainable way that would have major consequences. And so uh, they had much less use of materials, uh, waste, water, energy, so they saved a lot of money by giving this tool. And I think that, and I gave a talk at, at RISD uh, later, uh, earlier this uh, semester, uh, which is really fascinating to talk to these, you know, people who do really different stuff than, than I'm used to. Um, and uh, so I think we're going to try to do some uh, experimental course, RISD and Brown, about how can you do design for social uh, uh, innovation. Uh, can you design it in so you don't have to remediate it afterwards? And so I think that that's a big place where we need to go if we're going to make an impact. Okay. I think we've come to the end of our time. Um, I want to thank you all for uh, uh, being here. And if you want to walk around Watson, please feel free. <laughs>